Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the PACOM and CMS Partnership for IC10 training, specifically for small practice managers. We're very grateful to be working with CMS in this effort. Certainly, the IC10 transition is significant and impacts all of our practices, and we feel that the best way to um, defend ourselves against change pain is to be prepared. So we're very grateful for um, this webinar and others in the series do this webinar every single month. And um, today we are going to talk about clinical documentation. All right, I would like to introduce our CMS primary tech. She's Denicia Green. She is a C health insurance specialist with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Ms. Green's 15 years of health experience spans over a wide variety of CMS programs and policy, including Medicare, Medicare Advantage, Medicaid, Program Integrity, Audit, Quality, Public and Population Health, Health IT, Health Insurance Exchanges, and most recently, our favorite, ICD-10 Implementation Oversight. With that, I introduce Denicia Green. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, you know, we're very excited about the uh, partnership that we have with PACOM. And, you know, since March, we've been able to bring a number um, of free ICD-10 webinars um, to this group. And we hope that you find, uh, found those useful um, and would offer up any additional ICD-10 topics that uh, you all think would be uh, good for you all to know uh, more information on. Um, we thank you, of course, for all the work that you're doing right now to move ICD-10 forward, um, you know, in terms of the industry, but also within your own individual organizations. Uh, we need those ICD-10 champions out there, and we know that you all are the right people to do just that. Um, so what I'd like to do at this time is to introduce um, Dr. Joseph Nichols. Um, Dr. Nichols is a board-certified orthopedic surgeon by training who has been in healthcare for over 35 years. Um, he has 15 years of experience focused on healthcare um, IT, including product management, database design, quality metrics, and so forth. Um, he spent five years uh, as the CEO of a Medicaid third-party administration company. He currently co-chairs three sub-work groups for the work group for electronic data interchange, and that's WEEDI uh, as an acronym, and has numerous national presentations for payers, um, providers, and related um, to ICD-10 over the past two years. He's also a certified ICD-10 uh, coding trainer and received the Weedy Merit Award in 2009 and 2010. Um, what can I say? He's a great guy. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Nichols. Thank you. Well, thank you, Denisha. And uh, good uh, morning to all of those on the West Coast and afternoon for those on the East Coast. So today we're going to talk about clinical documentation. Uh, which is near and dear to my heart because uh, I believe that all data uh, is only as reliable as the source from which we get that data. And the source from which we get that data is from the observations of clinicians and their documentation. And then hopefully that documentation is appropriately translated into codes to be represented in good data that we can use for analysis. So our agenda today is we're really going to talk about uh, why is clinical documentation and good coding important? What are some of the strategies for working with physicians and other clinicians? What is the impact on clinician and coder relationship? How can I make the things easier for clinicians? What types of documentation is needed for different specialties and clinical areas of patient conditions? Uh, where should I focus my energies? How can I identify the needs to be documented? And how can I make sure the documentation is quality? So there's a lot of uh, stuff to to cover here. We're going to dive right into that. First, uh, why is documentation important? Well, it's clearly important because it supports proper payment and reduced denials. It assures that we have some accurate measures of quality and efficiency. It assures accountability and transparency in an environment where we're looking at accountable care and um, uh, value-based purchasing. It captures the level of risk and severity to a much uh, to, to the appropriate degree, it provides better business intelligence, sports research, communication, 
the bottom line is good documentation is all about good care. And we're going to emphasize that during the course of this discussion because when we're talking about documentation, of course, it's important for data, for payment, for ICD-10. The bottom line is the documentation we're talking about really is primarily focused on good care. And if done properly, it will address the other issues. We do know that in ICD-10 we have a lot of new concepts that really help us get a better understanding of severity and risk, better concepts uh, related to comorbidities, manifestations, etiology and causation, uh, complications, a, a whole series of things that we can now capture that are very important in patient care, very important in understanding severity and risk, and assuming we can capture this information in the documentation, we should be able to translate that into codes in ICD-10. Now, just to review kind of briefly the history, I went online and I found this old document back from the Civil War era, and it was uh, dated 1889, and it was a disability evaluation that was done by a clinician to determine whether a, a patient with a gunshot wound uh, actually was uh, um, appropriate for receiving disability payments. And so this was a sort of a disability evaluation. And in looking at this, even though, you know, some of it's hard to read from, you can see that they're, they're very specific. They, the problem is clearly stated. It was a gunshot wound of the right thigh with rheumatism. Uh, vital signs were, were clearly stated, the patient's age. As we dig further into it, it says the patient had two small superficial circular scars about the middle of the right thigh. It goes on to describe uh, other sorts of injuries. It states that this occurred on the uh, 12th of February, 1864, slight scar above the sacrum. It talks about uh, a prior amputation of the index, middle, and ring finger, and it tells exactly where those amputations were. So it goes into a great deal of detail, and at the bottom of, of gathering all this information and putting it together, there was a basic assessment that said, you know, this patient had a gunshot wound, but it didn't have anything to do with rheumatism, so they couldn't get an additional $4 a month disability. So, again, at, even way back then, when we had, did not have the technology that we have today, the bottom line is, is that we were doing pretty decent documentation. Now, we might ask, are we better today? Well, certainly we have a lot better ability to gather uh, information. We have electronic health records. We have templates. We have a variety of other things. But we still, in many instances, lack the type of documentation that we'd like to see. We're still getting some documentation that, frankly, you can't even read, let alone it's not capturing all the important details. So we have to ask ourselves, in most instances, you know, are we doing better or worse? And, and we know that unless we actually do an internal assessment. But clearly, there is opportunity for improvement. Now, I put this up saying bad mojo is not a diagnosis. We have to state specifically what the patient's problem is. And poor quality documentation really is bad for payers, providers, and patients. It impacts billing accuracy, quality measures, population management, risk management, health analytics. Most importantly, poor documentation impacts patient care. When I see my physician, I'd like to know that all the important things that I'm presented are actually documenting and will be available for either that same physician or another physician when I come in the following week. So it's really, again, all about good patient care. If we look at how we actually get to the code, where it all begins, well, it all begins from a source. Um, a clinician will uh, review external records, will uh, obtain a history from the patient, will uh, do a physical exam, We'll look at internal record reviews, studies, and basically gather all of this information, all of these observations, and put them in a way so that uh, we actually have an accurate assessment uh, and uh, documentation of that assessment and arrive at a diagnosis. Now, given that, though, the way we've been coding probably could use some improvement. The fact that we have a Superville that has just a number of check marks is probably not really capturing what we need or even allow us to code what's documented accurately. So, for example, if we look at an orthopedic Superville, um, we have all of the codes on a single page, and we have a small section for fractures at the radius, and there's some codes that you can pick. Um, uh, but the bottom line is, uh, that uh, we have 32 codes a day, we're going to have 1,731 codes in ICD-10. So it's going to be tough to do a uh, analysis of documentation uh, 
uh, and what we might need for it in ICD-10 when we have so many codes and base that on a super bill. Once this information goes through, uh, the challenge really is, is now how do we get to a good code? Well, frequently that information goes back, there's something on the side of the super bill, and we end up with a query saying, I just don't have enough documentation to get to the right code. We also know that the relationship between coders and coders could probably use some improvement and is going to be very important as we move forward uh, in ICD-10 uh, because coders and clinicians are going to be partners in many ways in some of these codings, both on the inpatient and uh, on the professional side. We need to recognize the important role of coders. Uh, we need to have some level of civility and respect between coders and clinicians. We have to realize that we're all on the same team, uh, that we're speaking a common language. We have to share learning because there's a lot that as a clinician, we really don't know about the details of coding and a lot clearly on the coding side, they really don't understand the clinical side. So we really have to look at sharing that information. We have to work together to solve problems. We have to try and accomplish the same thing and avoid audit issues, get some efficiencies, monitor documentation and coding quality, and to try and help reduce uh, coding queries, which nobody likes. If we look at how we're coding today, we can see that we use, even though there's lots of codes, there's currently 14,500 some diagnosis codes on the ICD-9 side, really about 5% of the codes account for 70% of the charges going out the door. If we look at the next 10%, it's 10% 10 of the codes represent almost 85% of the charges. So we tend to use a very small set of the codes. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing because a lot of the codes that you look at when you look at the data are pretty vague and nonspecific codes and really are not going to work well for us in a, in a new environment of accountability and certainly are not going to work well as we move into ICD-10. So we're going to need to look at using more codes, but the bottom line is there's a lot of codes that we simply don't use. If we look, for example, at different areas and how ICD-9 and ICD-10 is changing in terms of just the volumes of codes, it's highly different between different types of clinical uh, areas. So, for example, ICD-9, we have 747 codes related to fractures today. In ICD-10, there's 17,000 codes related to fractures. So there's a huge change in the number of codes, and there's a very specific reason for that that we'll get into. Poisoning and toxin. Toxic effects, quite a bit of a change. Pregnancy related, almost twice as many codes. But as we look at some other areas, there's been minimal change. The change for codes related to migraines, for example, is only increased by four. For bleeding disorders, is only increased by four. And then there's a number of uh, different conditions where the number of codes has actually gone down. For mood related disorders, there's actually less codes in ICD-10 than in ICD-9. In stage renal disease, there's half the number of codes we have today as in respiratory failure. So it all depends on the clinical area. In some areas, we're having a fairly dramatic increase in the codes. In other areas, we're actually seeing less codes in ICD-10 because it was felt that some of the codes that were there in ICD-9 really are not relevant and helpful from a data perspective. So the bottom line is each clinical area is somewhat different. If we look at why there are so many codes, it's really because we have recurring patterns. So for example, if I look at every fracture, and we know that fractures are expanding dramatically, the reason we have so many codes is that for the same fracture, we have to identify whether well, it's initial encounter, subsequent encounter, or sequelae, and you can see the number of codes here that that impacts. We have to define whether it's right or left, and one-third of all of the codes are simply the same except for right or left. For fractures and follow-up, we have to state whether it's routine healing, delayed healing, non-union, or malunion. So as we add these parameters and we add a new code for each one of those, you can see how the codes rapidly multiply. But the number of concepts really is not that much. It's really learning the patterns and it's learning what needs to be documented because what needs to be documented can impact virtually thousands of codes.
So let's take a look at a medical scenario. So we have a 27-year-old male uh, who's seen a follow-up for a Smith's fracture. We'll talk about what that is. On the right side, that it was exposed through an open wound with minimal opening and minimal tissue damage. And the fracture had not healed after six months. So that's a basic, very terse description of the patient's condition. And even though we didn't explicitly state it, the fact that we said Smith's fracture tells us something, that this was a fracture of the distal radius and it was dorsally angulated and it was outside of the joint, it was displaced because that's the definition of a Smith's fracture. So that was implied and the fact that we said it was minimal opening, minimal tissue damage told us that this was a Gestio class one open fracture and the fact that it had not healed after six months told us there was a non-union. So if we look in red, these are all key clinical concepts about the patient that have been captured in some documentation, whether directly uh, stated or implied. So let's look at how this would map out. So in the middle, you'll see those concepts, subsequent encounter, non-union fracture. These are all the, the medical concepts about that patient's specific condition. Now, if I took those medical concepts and says, how would I describe those in IC9, the best code I can come up with is this code over here, 81352, fracture radius open and distal. So that covers some of the concepts. If I look at SNOMED, for example, the best single code in SNOMED I could use for that, there's, this is the code, and if we look at the concepts, it covers more. If I look at ICD-10, I cover virtually all of the key concepts in that scenario, except the fact that it was a male and he was 27 years old. So ICD-10 in this particular case, I'm able to capture a lot more of the specific medical concepts that are important in the patient care than I could in, in ICD-9. We do know that there are a lot of new concepts that are being captured specifically, and I'm using an example of fractures, and, and every area has its own, and we'll show a couple of other examples. But open fracture, for example, Gustillo class, whether it's a 1, 2, 3A, that's new to ICD-10. Salter-Harris classification, that's also new, whether it's a Salter-1 uh, through Salter-4. Uh, whether it's a displaced or non-displaced fracture, whether it goes into the joint. All of these things are critically important in terms of establishing the nature and the severity of the patient's condition. In ICD-9, we really couldn't capture these things. Well, in ICD-10, uh, they're now part of normal coding and, and again, will be seen uh, in different variations of the same type of fracture codes. So let's look at some other conditions and see kind of what's happened on the side of documentation. So let's take something common like otitis media. And if we look at otitis media, one of the things, and I'll go back to this a little bit later, but you know, we were taught in medical school is there's some key things we need to capture about the patient's condition. And I think most clinicians would say, yeah, these are things that if the patient has them, we should probably capture. What type of otitis? Was it serous? Was it superative or non-superative? In other words, was there purulence with it? Was it tubotympanic type of, was it aticoantral type? Was it allergic? Was it a mucoid type? So if any of these conditions is true and relevant to the patient, they should be documented because they'll be important in coding. Also in ICD-10, as in ICD-9, there are a lot of alternative terms that might be used, and the, all of these alternative terms are defined in the tabular index that says, well, if you see one of these terms, this is generally what it would go to. So if you see terms like sanguinous or seromucinous or exudative, those, all of these things may make a difference in which codes are collected by their reference to the description of the code. We also see that there are certain factors of what's associated with the otitis media. Was there a spontaneous rupture? Was there no spontaneous rupture? Was there an infectious or other external agent involved? And if there was, what an agent? Um, was this staphylococcal? Was it streptococcal? Uh, was, there, was it associated with smoking and, and to what degree? Was it uh, related to allergic or non-allergic conditions? We also need to capture temporal factors like was this acute or subacute or chronic? Was it recurrent? Uh, laterality, uh, was it left or right? Was it bilateral or was it unilateral? If we look at 
the ICD-10 codes to kind of see how this is uh, related to these codes, we'll see that we have codes like measles complicated by otitis media. We have codes like acute serous otitis media. We have codes that have a number of different concepts, acute, separative otitis media with spontaneous rupture of the ear drum and left uh, of involving the left ear. So in order to select the right codes, we have to be able to capture the right clinical concepts that would allow us to select those. Now the good news is all of those clinical concepts are things that probably should be documented anyway, even today and outside of uh, ICD-10 environment. Let's look at another example, pulmonary disease. And we're gonna include chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, chronic bronchitis, and asthma. So what sort of things do we need to document to get to coding? And again, we need to document a lot more of this than this for good patient care, but what are the types of things that need to be documented just to make sure that we arrive at a good code? First, what caused it? Was it chemical or environmental agents? And if so, which agent? Was it associated with smoking? And was it one of these types of, of smoking uh, relationships? Is it allergic or non-allergic? What are the temporal factors around that uh, chronic pulmonary disease? Acute, chronic, is it intermittent? Is it persistent? Is it severe, severe mild, moderate, or severe? Bronchitis specific uh, concepts, is it simple bronchitis, mucopurulent, mixed? Is there tracheitis or tracheobronchitis associated with it? For emphysema specific concepts, if it's a unilateral pulmonary emphysema, which could be uh, uh, used by any one of these, uh, if it's pan lober uh, emphysema, if it's central lober emphysema, uh, all of those things become important in terms of documentation. In terms of other emphysema, here are some other concepts. For other types of COPD, whether there's an acute respiratory infection, whether, whether there's exacerbation, whether there's chronic obstructive um, uh, pulmonary disease, all of those things are really quite important. From an asthma specific type, uh, different types of, of asthma need to be documented if indeed they're present. If the patient has a very specific type of documentation, it may make a difference in treatment, certainly may make a difference in analysis of coding, should be documented. There are just some other alternative terms for asthma specific. Other alternative terms, again, for asthma-specific related conditions. Also, if it's asthma, we want to know whether it's uncomplicated or whether it's acute with acute exacerbation or with status asthmaticus. So as you can see, there's a, a number of terms that need to be defined. All of those terms are generally part of documentation or, or should be if, if present. And they need to be documented in order for us to identify the right code. For example, if we look at these set, sets of codes, in order to identify the type of bronchitis, I need to know, is this mixed, simple, or mucopurulent chronic bronchitis? Is it acute bronchitis? Is it a different type of bronchitis? If there's emphysema, what type of emphysema is it? Uh, if there is uh, asthma, is, there, is it mild intermittent asthma with acute exacerbation, or is it severe persistent asthma with status asthmaticus? All of these things, again, are important in terms of capturing the nature of the patient's condition, the risk, the severity, and they're critically important in terms of determining uh, aspects of patient care. Now, that being said, we tend to be use very unspecified codes, and I, I think that there is a sense that we really don't need uh, all of these details in the code um, because they're not important, and I, I think we can clearly say they are important. They're important in terms of analyzing the data we have. They define risk and severity substantially. All of th those things go into analysis. They go into uh, looking at uh, uh, distributions of diseases, patterns of diseases, they're involved in research, they're involved in payment models, they're involved in auditing, they're involved in any number of things that impact both the business and clinical and analytic side of healthcare. So we do need to be specific, otherwise we really don't have good data that we can rely on. Now, 
if we try and identify what we mean by specified coding, you can't just say don't use unspecified codes because that really doesn't mean anything because there, it's difficult to define what an unspecified code is. The fact that it uses the word unspecified does not necessarily mean the code is not specific. And there are many codes that never use the word unspecified that are highly unspecific. So I'd like to propose that we define poorly specified code as any coding that does not fully define important parameters of the patient condition that could otherwise be defined given information available to the observer and the coder. So given that we have that information available to both the clinician who's observed and the coder, then the code should really reflect as accurately as possible what that condition is. We also know that sometimes unspecified makes sense. In other words, sometimes the patient may be early in the course of evaluation where the patient comes in and they say they have abdominal pain and they're rather vague. We can't really, despite looking at this, can't really identify a great deal of detail about that. And we don't want to jump to a conclusion, say, oh, this patient has cholecystitis, because we really don't have that information at that point. So at that point in time, using unspecified codes makes sense. The patient has abdominal pain. They're in the process of workup. When the patient comes in, hopefully we'll have a more specific diagnosis. If by the 10th visit, the same patient still has a diagnosis of abdominal pain, we have to wonder what we're really accomplishing. Uh, because clearly we should have more information to get a better definition of the patient's condition. In some instances, the claim may be coming from a provider who is not directly related to diagnosis of the patient's condition, some other ancillary provider or uh, ambulance person. In those instances, we're really not expecting specified codes because they may not have that information and they may not be in a position to, to make that diagnosis. And sometimes the clinic, clinician seeing the patient may be more of a generalist and not able to define the condition or at a level of detail expected by a specialist. The, the generalist may know that the young patient has a fracture and may document that the fracture seems to go through the growth plate, but they may not know which Salter Harris classification it is. So sometimes we expect to see less specified codes. The, the key is that it should be as specific as possible given the information available to the observer and the clinician and the ability to uh, uh, the level of detail of that clinician. There is a lot of time, though, when we really should not be using unspecified codes at all. If we have sufficient information available for, to more accurately define the condition, we really shouldn't be using unspecified codes. For certain basic concepts, such as laterality, I mean, we ought to know our difference between right and left. We should not be using codes that say unspecified side because generally you shouldn't be treating the patient unless you know that. Anatomical locations, we ought to be reasonably specific in terms of the anatomical location. We, if we're treating a patient with, uh, who is pregnant, we ought to have in there the documentation of which trimester it is, which weeks of gestation. Not only is it important to coding, but also to code unspecified trimester really doesn't give us the information that's important, and we have that information or should have that information available. Types of diabetes. Uh, clearly, we ought to know what type of diabetes it is if we're treating it. Uh, we ought to know uh, um, if there are known complications and comorbidities. We should uh, be specific about those. And if there is a description of severity, uh, acute or chronic or other known parameters, we ought to be able to capture those within the code. So there are some instances where unspecified really doesn't make sense because, in general, you shouldn't be treating the patient if you really didn't have that information. And if you did, it ought to be documented. Where, in addition, we should, where care is implemented that demands a more specific level of detail, we ought to have that information. If I'm going to treat a patient and that detail is important in treatment, I ought to have that defined. And if at different specialty levels, we would expect greater levels of detail than at less specialty or more general levels. The bottom line is we're trying to get to good patient data. And good patient data is critically important for a lot of reasons. It's important for payment. It's important for quality measures. It's important for effectiveness analysis. It's important for patient care because we use this data that's the only national standard that we have that defines patient health condition and if we're going to exchange this information with other entities it becomes an important part of the exchange of information. Uh, it's important for uh, payment for a variety of other reasons. 
But the bottom line is good patient data is important. Uh, and in order to get to good patient data, it requires three things. We have to have a complete observation of all of the objective and subjective uh, facts relevant to the patient condition. The same thing that we were taught in medical school, which says, if you see that patient, there's key parameter of that patient condition you should document, including potential causes, other relevant factors that might impact disease, potential complications or comorbidities. That was, you know, something that we were taught in medical school is we should be asking those questions, observing, and, and we should be documenting them. On the documentation side, there's a general rule. If you didn't document it, it wasn't observed and it didn't happen. We have no record of what happens if or why, and that information is critically important in patient care, and it's also critically important in getting to the right codes and the right data. On the coding perspective, we have to have good coding that includes all of the key medical concepts supported by this coding standard and guideline. So good data means good observation, it means good documentation and good coding, and if we want to get a good data, we have to make sure that all of those things are in place. If any one of them is not in place, we're simply not going to be able to get good data. In addition, good data really means that we are going through a continuous quality improvement loop where we're looking to see how well uh, things are getting coded, uh, uh, we need to analyze that and constantly come back and see if we can't audit what we're doing uh, internally and provide continuous feedback saying this is an area where we could potentially uh, do a bit more. So in summary, uh, clinical documentation is really not just about coding and coding is not just about payment. Accurate coding is a requirement for good healthcare data. Good healthcare data is critical to improving the quality of care, effectiveness of care, and assuring patient safety. Complete and accurate documentation of important clinical concepts of patient condition is the requirement for good patient care. The requirements for documentation to support ICD-10 are consistent with the documentation to support good patient care and improve healthcare data. In looking at ICD-10, I've looked at a lot of the different codes of, over a very long period of time. I can tell you that in the vast majority of cases, all of the documentation required is documentation. It, it is nothing new. It, it, it's stuff that we have experience with, that we've seen before, that we should be documenting today in most instances where appropriate. Um, and, and so it's not a new burden of documentation. We're really talking about making sure the documentation that's there, that it's important to patient care, and is also needed for proper coding uh, is in place. And, and frankly, we could probably use a bit of work on that. So at this point, um, I think we're ready for any questions. I tried to get through that to save plenty of time for questions. So I'll um, open it up for questions this time. Go ahead and type your questions into the chat and then we'll, we will read them and uh, answer them in turn. We have a couple of them up here right now, um, but uh, don't worry about it. Just go ahead and type them in there, and then we'll get to all of your questions. Oh, I shouldn't promise. <laughs> we'll, we'll probably get to all of your questions, and if we don't, then we'll give you um, an opportunity to, uh, to email them to us, or we'll copy them down and respond to you as well. Okay, so so let me take a stab at a couple of these questions. Again, I'll try and get to um, uh, as many as I can. Uh, the first question was really does uh, um, we talked about the potential uh, impacts or delays of payment. And again, that really does not apply, as we said, to documentation. We talked about it previously. But basically, um, any time we have a major transition in healthcare, there is the potential that we could see uh, Im uh, impacts to uh, payment or delays in payments across providers. And certainly, it's certainly um, reasonable to be prepared for that and start thinking through that. We don't know what that impact is going to be. We haven't been through that before. We do know that most of the payers have spent uh, the past several years preparing for this. Uh, but the bottom line, it's a big change. And any time there's a big change, you always want to be prepared. Um, got another question here about the SNF. Um, Okay, there, and this has come up before. What does a, a skilled nursing facility or, or for that matter, any other provider do when they don't have sufficient documentation to do proper coding? Uh, and again, that's a real challenge. Um, 
if you don't have that documentation, you may be forced into doing a less specified code simply because you don't have that uh, information. Uh, the bottom line is is that given the information you have, given your ability to, to look at that patient, determine that condition, you want to use the most specific code you can. Sometimes it's very nonspecific simply because that's the best you can do. But given that you do have that information, then it would certainly be uh, uh, important to, to, to include it. Uh, another question, how would you suggest we present the needs to the physicians? Well, that's a tough one, and I, I do a lot of presentations around the country to physicians, and, and, and I, it is a challenge because, in general, most physicians are really not happy about this. It's viewed as another burden, and uh, I, I think a lot of that is because that's been the message out there from, uh, from a lot of other organizations that this is a big burden. I think the bottom line, and when I talked to physicians, I said, look, ICD-10 is one of those things that, uh, you know, is, is one of those mandates that's out there. But if you really look at what's required, it really isn't anything new. It's nothing that we aren't familiar with. Uh, for every, patient, every physician treating a diabetic patient, some of the things that are required for coding in, in uh, patients with diabetes are things we see today, uh, things that we should know today. This is not specific to ICD-10. I think there is really um, um, uh, a belief that we've got all these new documentation requirements, and I, I don't really think we do. I think they're documentation requirements that have always been there. It's just now that we, if we don't have them, it's going to be a challenge to do proper coding. And we do know that we need some improvement in documentation. Uh, I know that almost anyone who's done a lot of chart reviews will say, yeah, there's, there's room for improvement. Um, so I, I think the focus when talking to physicians is really all about it's good patient care, it's good documentation, and by the way, this is important in, in the analysis for your quality, your payment, of data for research, for a variety of other things, but the key focus is this is documentation that we ought to be doing for good patient care. Uh, another question says, is there a chance that there will be a delay in ICD-10 past October 2014? Uh, you know, I have no crystal ball. I think it's uh, highly unlikely, given the fact that we are so far down the line, that there's been numerous uh, commitments that we are going there from uh, many different sources. So I think it's highly unlikely at this point we'll see any further delay in ICD-10 because of the effect it would have to the industry and the folks that have already well down the pathway to moving in that direction. To move it would be a huge impact to them. Uh, but the bottom line is that's the date and it's been pretty much firmed up. Dr. Nichols, I'll also add to this. This is Denicia Green. Um, our administrator, uh, Marilyn Tavner, has also um, affirmed that th this is the uh, date that we're um, going forward with. Um, the October 2014 date is a, a, a firm date. Um, we are moving forward towards that date internally with our our systems and um, with Medicare, Medicaid, um, uh, the, the Medicare Advantage plans across the board uh, internal to CMS, um, we are um, moving towards that date. Um, and we're also, we've uh, uh, issued an industry timeline uh, to focus on that specific date. And we're talking to everyone right now about internal testing as a key milestone of where you should be in terms of your implementation and your planning. Um, but, you know, we've held many stakeholder meetings um, and we've talked to many payers, uh, many uh, uh, other providers, and everyone is going down the same path with the intent that October 1, 2014 is a firm date. Thank you. Thanks, Tanisha. So, so hopefully that that helps kind of shine a light on it. So, um, again, no one can put the future, but as Tanisha says, looks pretty solid moving forward. The next question says, let's say a patient has pneumonia. How do you specify organism unless you do a bronchoscopy or sputum analysis on a patient? It's a good question. Um, the bottom line is, and as we mentioned previously. The diagnostic process is a journey, and it starts off very nonspecific and, and generally gets more specific as we go. So, indeed, if you saw a patient coming in with a pneumonia, uh, you might use initially a less specific code that doesn't specify the organism simply because you don't have that information. 
So uh, that's the initial diagnosis code that is, is presented on that particular encounter. The patient comes in two weeks later, you've got some additional information on what type of pneumonia it is. You may have some further information about parameters of the patient care, or other sorts of things, and those things are documented at that point in time. Then at that point in time, we should have a much more specific code. In other words, that pneumonia should now include those levels of specificity. So. As we move through patient care, we should get more progressively specific in terms of our documentation and our coding as we move forward. Uh, let's see if we can tackle another one here. Um, uh, are there any good resources for specialty specific crossover codes? Um, Yes, and I think this brings up a good point. Uh, it, you know, as we mentioned, the impact uh, of these codes in different clinical areas is very different. Uh, the biggest area hit really is the musculoskeletal side, anything related to musculoskeletal, primarily because we have a lot of repetition of those codes because we have multiple parameters for multiple different types of fractures, for example. So we have lots of codes. A number of concepts hasn't increased greatly, but we have lots of, uh, of codes in that area. Certain other areas like um, uh, behavioral health, impact in terms of the numbers and types and description of the codes is really pretty limited. There hasn't been a huge change uh, in those codes. As a matter of fact, a number such as mood disorders have actually, the number of codes has actually gone down. So each area is different. Uh, there are some different specially focused tools that are out there by a variety of different vendors. Uh, there's different uh, specially focused documentation. Uh, I know I've gotten presentations for groups in specific special areas to say here are some of the areas that but you can get that information basically by doing the research looking at those particular codes seeing what are some of the new concepts that are out there how they're organized and start putting together a plan that says you know uh, for example in OB uh, all of the OB codes are going to require that we uh, state uh, trimester so maybe we should include that in our templates uh, so we address that right up front or capture it right up front so that we have that information captured and that impacts thousands of codes so each specialty area will need to look a bit differently in their particular areas uh, and I don't think there's anyone who's got a magic solution but there are a number of tools out there a uh, question about the number of general surgery codes with ICD-10 um, uh, I'd like to be able to give you a number right off the bat. I, I really can't because I haven't broken out general surgery and broken it out specifically by codes. Uh, I know that there are um, some codes for uh, on the inpatient procedure side, which is the PCS side, which does not impact uh, professionals. There is a substantial change in the coding on inpatient procedures. Uh, from that side, of course, on the professional side, we're still using CPT and HCPCS, so there's no impact there. In terms of the diagnosis in these areas, there have been some changes there, but it's a pretty broad area. So I, I, I'd like to give you a good, clean answer, but I don't have one right off the top of my head. Um, here is one. Do you feel that the physicians need to be more active with documentation and not the coders? Well, I... I couldn't agree more. I mean, the physician is really responsible for assessing and documenting the facts. The coders can certainly help remind physicians that there is certain documentation they need for coding, but basically the, the physician is responsible for capturing the proper documentation necessary for care and, and doing it completely and accurately. And that being said, if that's done, thoroughly, then it should not be impacting coders. But we, we do know there's going to be a lot of querying back and forth, but the bottom line is the physician is responsible for documentation of the patient's clinical condition. Uh, see, do the doctor need to include a diagnosis of the patient's other conditions? Well, if you look at the coding guidelines, clearly if a patient's other condition has an impact uh, on that patient's treatment at that point in time. And if indeed that is the information is not already included in the code that you're including, then you will have to use other codes. And there are very specific guidelines about when you do or do not use extra codes and which codes you use and in what sequence. It's all part of the, the coding guidelines and there's a lot of information. That, the simple rule is, is that if there is a diagnosis uh, 
or there's a diagnostic code that relates to the treatment of that patient at that point in time, uh, and it's not included in the information in the specific code you already have, then you need to add that code. So that's just kind of a simple rule of thumb, but you have to look at the guidelines specific for specific cases to see what the rules say. To what extent does our provider have to learn all these new codes, and to what extent can our coder billing simply adjust the code to the new one by reading the chart note? Well, that's a good question. I, I, there are some folks who are really heading towards what's called point-of-service coding. In other words, they're asking clinicians to actually select the code. They're, most folks are, are not. They're asking physicians to document accurately, and they're uh, coding from that documentation. So in general, I, I don't think that for most physicians, particularly in small practices, we expect them to learn all of these codes, and they would be bored trying to learn all these codes, and it really wouldn't make any sense for them. What they do need to know is that, for example, if you're a, a practicing orthopedic surgeon and you see a patient with fractures, that you're going to need to document whether well, there's an initial encounter, subsequent encounter, or sequelae. Now, maybe that's not the physician necessarily capturing that. Maybe it's captured at the time the patient comes in. But the physician will need to document if it's a subsequent encounter, whether it's normal healing, delayed healing, non-union, or malunion. That should be just generally part of a template. We also need to capture whether it's the right side or left side, which is just good practice. So given that level of documentation, those simple parameters impact literally thousands of codes in repetition. So uh, we should be capturing those concepts. We should be capturing it. Uh, as a normal part of doing business, all of those concepts could be captured with outside of the physician as part of the interview process or as part of the nurse interview. Or there's a variety of ways of limiting uh, that capture or making it more efficient. But basically, it needs to be documented uh, and approved by the clinician. Uh, next question, what is the training recommendation for providers? Um, Again, when we say providers, it's a rather broad term. Um, I speak to provider groups where I'm speaking to the billing people, the coding people, the, the clinicians, nurse practitioners, others within that organization. So it needs to be focused on the specific target audience. But if we're talking specifically about physicians, I believe that most of the training for physicians really is about what are the new requirements for documentation around ICD-10, why are they important, what are some thoughts in terms of how to incorporate that into your templates and make it a normal part of when you see a patient with a certain condition, you always capture these things. Not only because ICD-10 requires it, but it's just good practice to be capturing patients' trimesters or other types of things that are required. Uh, next question, um, is CMS going to uh, uh, provide any automated tools to assist with the transition? And I'm not aware of that. Denisha, can you respond to that? Are you available, Denisha? Okay, well, we'll try and tap into her. Uh, she may be uh, offline, so we'll try and tap her later. But as far as I'm aware, of, there are not any tools necessarily that CMS, and again, depends on how we define tools, where there's plenty of educational materials, there's templates, there's a lot of stuff that can be di downloaded, there's implementation guides, but in terms of if we're talking about specific automated, meaning software or other tools, I'm not aware of any, but we'll, we can follow up on that. Um, are consultants or training programs recommended for physicians for ICD-10 specialty coding? Um, there are certainly plenty out there. Uh, I can't tell you that I can tell you one's better than the other. Uh, I think you really have to look for your own organization, your own specialty. They're going to vary, uh, and you just have to do your own due diligence. I, there isn't one. I'd say these are the people to go with, and I don't really think that that would be appropriate. Um, any views on using voice recognition technology to improve documentation since EHR data entry uh, they're frustrated with EHR. Well, I can certainly relate to that. I look at some of the EHRs and go trying to just walk through and implement stuff. It can get pretty frustrating because it really doesn't work the way I think. And there are certainly a lot of physicians who say, you know, I I did a good job documenting uh, through dictation. Uh, I, you know, I want to continue doing that. You know, and that's something you need to decide internally what you want to do. The bottom line is is that technology does not improve capturing the information that we need. We can have the best technology tool in the world uh, unless we state 
the the concepts or the facts, it, it, we don't have anything to work with. It's kind of like uh, someone buying the best possible word processing tool and think it'll make them an author. You know, it re it really doesn't. You have to capture the documentation. How you do that is probably less important that you do capture those things. Uh, and each organization will vary how they do that. A lot of folks are using dictation and they are using natural language processing to try and pull out structured data out of that. There's a variety of different approaches, but the di information has to be there for any of these things to work. Uh, another question, uh, will the coding descriptions be more intuitive and therefore easier to find? Well, I've spent a lot of time looking at the descriptions of both, and, and frankly, I think ICD-10 is, is a lot more intuitive and easier to use because uh, unlike ICD-9, it's uh, it, everything very patterned, and so we see a lot of repeating patterns, but it, it, there's a lot of consistency in those patterns. And once you kind of learn those patterns, it actually, I think it's easier to find stuff in there. Even though there's a lot more codes, uh, it, it's easier to find from my perspective, and, and it seems to be more consistent than a lot of things I've seen in ICD-9. Um, okay, so let's go to the next one. We've been told when documenting not to use phrases like Smith's procedure, uh, that they need to be documented for each element. For procedures, in general, um, uh, to support documentation for procedure coding, you do need to be more specific and use less eponyms, uh, uh, such as, uh, you know, um, uh, Bill Roth procedure or other named procedure, um, because for ICD-10 procedure coding, those are all broken out by what specifically was done during the operation. Now on the diagnosis side, the ICD-10 CM or diagnosis side, uh, a lot of those codes are do keep in eponyms. So you'll see a lot of eponyms uh, named fractures, for example, like Smith's fracture or Jones fracture or Colley's fracture or Galeazzi fracture. All those named fractures are still in. As a matter of fact, some of those have actually been added to ICD-10. So there is a bit of difference between the diagnosis and procedure side, so that on the procedure side we're tending more towards less of these eponyms, and on the uh, diagnosis side we still have a lot of those in there, and actually they do bring some value, because if I say that a patient has a Collis fracture I, in that short term, I can say a lot about what the patient's condition is. And so I think there are some values, and it's also uh, fairly consistently defined. A college fracture is fairly consistently defined. So I, you have to look at the difference between diagnosis and procedure codes on that. Uh, can you tell me why we need all these extra codes? Well, that, that's interesting because um, if we look at most of what these codes do, um, most of these codes we have the extra codes because we've added more detail about risk and severity and other things. And we also have a lot of these codes simply because we're now combining these codes that we end up having to repeat them a lot. Uh, so we end up with multiple codes because we're repeating a lot of the same stuff over and over again. So I, I think that uh, generally the extra codes give us that ability to get more detailed information about severity and risk in, uh, in, uh, in a single code than we were able to get for. We also, though, have a lot of extra codes that everyone says, oh, those are silly codes, they don't make any sense. And certainly that's out there, um, uh, but we've had those codes in ICD-9 today. I mean, we have codes like hit by a spacecraft or suicide by paintball, those codes that seem kind of silly. Uh, but the reality is they've been in ICD-9 for years. Uh, those aren't anything new to ICD-10. We, we have certainly our share of new codes, but uh, those have been around for a long time. We just don't use them. Uh, you know, unless you're working for NASA, you really don't worry about getting hit by a spacecraft. But maybe if you do, you might want to capture that information because that might be part of analysis of injuries uh, at NASA. We don't know. They're there. You use the ones that, that make sense. You don't use the ones that don't make sense. Um, next question, internal testing. Do many EHR practice management systems have systems in place for ICD-10? Um, good question, and this is one you clearly need to ask of your vendors because obviously each EHR system is different and independent and they're at different levels of readiness. Most of the major EHR systems 
are well down the pathway to being ready to support CD10. In other words, their systems will support ICD-10. They, they provide that ability to capture it, to use ICD-10 in the electronic health records. You do have to be careful, however. There are a number of vendors out there who say we're ready, which simply means they'll support the codes, but their EHRs are not necessarily geared to capture all of the concepts that you need to capture or may not be structured, or they may say that's up to you to define the templates. And that's really where the key part of this is, is whether your system will help you support capturing those key things. Does your system for OB, for example, have a template that allows you to be able to capture on a regular basis which trimester, which weeks of gestation, or other key parameters about the patient care? So all of those things are, are really uh, critically important. Um, one quick question we wanted to touch on that came out is uh, um, the whole issue about using crosswalks or gems or something else to translate codes. And certainly whenever I talk to physicians, they say this isn't a matter of crosswalking because you, if you really do the analysis, you really can't crosswalk these things accurately. The provider's responsibility is to code as accurately as possible natively in that coding system. So you, you look at the code, uh, the, the patient's condition, you say, how would I describe that in ICD-10? You basically need to do, speak that new language because that's essentially the responsibility of the clinician is to state specifically as accurately as possible what that patient's condition is and the codes available to them. And so if that's ICD-10, they should pick the code that most accurately represents that. You can't get that by uh, crosswalking a 9 code to a 10 code. It, it won't get you where you need to go. Um, let me see. One other question here. Uh, that was more, We I think we've already covered that one. And in terms of one specific course to go to, I, you know, I, there are just so many out there, uh, a variety of different vendors of different cor uh, um, things available for uh, physicians, for coders, for office staff, for a variety of other folks. And certainly there's organizations like AHIMA and AAPC, uh, other organizations that uh, provide a lot of support in this area, a lot of references. Uh, but there are plenty out there. Um, the challenge really is there's probably too much out there. Uh, but uh, there, there's lots and lots of information out there that's relatively easy to find. And, of course, the CMS side has lots of information available that people can go to and, and pull down information. Uh, so I think we're uh, running close to our time. Um, um, any other uh, uh, thoughts, or Denisha, do you want to wrap things up here? I think there might be something wrong with her phone line. So, um, um, Denisha? No. Okay. Well, if that's everything, um, I want to thank you again, Dr. Nichols, for your time today and your focus on small practice issues because it is very different when you look at the small practice um, challenges um, in the ICD-10 transition. And our goal is to work with partners like CMS and offer as much preparatory training possible so that um, the small practice industry has every opportunity to be prepared. So change brings disruption, but let's minimize the disruption with as much education about being prepared as possible. Um, there's a slide in front of you with a mailbox on it. It's the IC10 questions at noblest.org. And if you're listening by phone and you don't see that, it's ICD10, no dash, questions at noblis.org, N-O-B-L-I-S.org, and you can send your questions there. If you didn't get that, you can send it to PACOM, and we'll make sure that it gets to CMS for you. Um, again, preparedness is the best way to ensure that you have the most revenue and that it's the least disruptive for you when this transition takes place. There are a lot of positive things about it, um, like Dr. Nichols said. Um, you know, when there are folks out there saying, gosh, the spacecraft, or gosh, the cost, and, you know, getting wrapped up in all of that doesn't help us get prepared. So sometimes it's a little harder than others, depending on the kind of day I've had. But I just try to remind myself that down the road, once this is done, 
um, we will be better for it, our patients will be better for it, and the most prepared we are, um, the more prepared we are, the easier it will be for us to do that. So thank you all very much for your interest. If you would like to see um, CMS address a particular part of this transition that we haven't addressed, please let us know. They are listening, they want to work with us, and PACOM is the voice of small practice management. So speak up and be heard and let them know what you need. If you missed a previous webinar, you can log on to the uh, youtube.com slash PACOM. There's a CMS playlist there, and you can see all of the CMS webinars that we've done previously. And they're wonderful because you can, you can jump to the part that you want, review that part when it's convenient for you and your physicians or you and your staff or whatever pieces that you need whenever you need it. So speak up, stay engaged. Thank you for attending, and you guys have a wonderful rest of your day.